Hello everyone, and welcome to this tutorial on the Pipeline Analysis Package, which is developed by Woodgroup. The purpose of today's tutorial is to provide some best practice advice on how to set up and validate models in Pipeline. So the model component Pipeline is one of the key components in that it brings together all the various building blocks or subcomponents that make up an installation scenario. In the model component, we essentially select what lines, vessels, and seabeds we want to combine together in an installation scenario. To show you how the model component works, I'm just going to quickly build a sample model. So this particular model is a shallow water SLA scenario. And the steps are very straightforward. First, I need to find a water depth, so shallow water depth. Then I need to select what seabed I want to use in the model. So in this project, there's only a flat rigid seabed. Typically, you'd have a variety of seabeds to select from, but this is a very simple project. Once I've added a seabed, then I can add my vessel. And again, it's just a selection from a dropdown. I need to give the vessel some coordinates in terms of where it is in the model space. The default is over the global origin, which is fine for most scenarios. There is quite a lot of versatility here in that I could add multiple vessels if I wished and position them in different positions uh, in the model space. But this is just a simple normal lay example. So I only need a single vessel. And once the vessel is in place, I get to check you know, the various support positions and the various origin positions. So I can zoom in at different parts of the vessel. I can see here there's a crosshair for VO slash SO, so that's the vessel origin and the stinger origin. In this particular case, both of them have been coincided at the vessel stern. And uh, with my coordinates, I've positioned them directly over the global origin, which is on the seabed. There's also a crosshair here for the VRP, the vessel reference point. And this is where all the, the vessel motions are applied. So my REOs or my vessel offsets are all applied to this point. If I zoom in here on the stinger, I can see there's uh, what's known as tangent points, TP points. And uh, these crosshairs represent yeah, the tangent points for the various radii that are used for mapping supports onto the stinger. So again, it just gives us a good idea of how the stinger uh, is constructed. And if I wish, I can also turn on um, the, the radius of curvature themselves. So these show me the arcs of curvature for the various sports positions. So again, you see a, view, a useful visual reference. So that's my vessel. And the next step then is to add a line. And in order to add a line, I need to connect it to certain points. So you can see here, there's already what's called a tensioner. Uh, VCP or vessel connection point and that's an automatic point that's created by pipeline at that, that uh, all the tensioners and I can see it here in the forward structure on the left hand side as well so I can hook my pipeline to that point but I also need to hook my pipeline to a point on the seabed the quickest and easiest way to do that is to uh, create a seabed connection point uh, with a seabed connection point I have the option for uh, allowing pipeline to calculate its position. Um, and if you want to quickly set up a model, then it's, it's probably best to get pipeline to calculate the position for us. So all these coordinates will, will change based on where pipeline calculates the position. So if I add that to my model, you can see it starts at the, the global origin, and that's because uh, I don't have a line connected to it at this point. If I add a line, Again, it's a selection from my project here on the left-hand side. My line needs a start point, so I can start it at my tensioner. It needs an endpoint, which can be my seabed connection point or my SCP. I have an option for flooding the line as well, but I don't need to do that in this instance. But once I've connected the line to the various connection points, straight away you can see that the seabed connection point has moved away from the origin. Uh, and that's because Pipeline has had to calculate or recalculate its position in order to get a, a realistic uh, catenary shape for, for the line. So that's uh, quite a useful calculation. I can also manually 
position this point myself as well if, if I wish, or indeed I can create a manual vessel connection point at any point on the vessel. But for normal lay scenarios such as this, it's often best just to use pipe lays, automatic connection points. So that's a, that's a, that's a model that has been quickly assembled. I suppose I haven't really kind of talked about common problems or issues that you may wish to keep in mind when you're building your models in pipeline. And in order to kind of discuss those issues, it's probably best to look at a separate model. So if I click on a, a different model here in the project, and this model has some inherent flaws uh, in it. And uh, these flaws will cause issues when it comes to running uh, the analysis or an analysis on the model. And often a poorly defined model will result in conversion difficulties. I can show that actually through running analysis on this particular model. So this is a, a normal lay analysis. I've selected the model in question. And when I run the analysis on this model, I will find that it inevitably runs into conversion difficulties. So you can see here, there's an error, solution has failed to converge. And below there, then there's a tip. So these tips usually give you an idea where the, where the problem lies. And this particular tip uh, is telling me to uh, review the model setup and make sure it's physically reasonable. So obviously, there's more than likely something fundamentally wrong with the model. So what is that? If I go back to the model component itself, what I need to do now here is validate the model setup. In order to validate a model, there's a series of steps we should undertake. The first step is to, to look at the connection points. And the connection points themselves need to have appropriate boundary conditions defined. So in the model, the model isn't concerned with boundary conditions. You're simply hooking the line to the connection point in the model. But the model is passed in OSIS engine, and in OSIS engine requires boundary conditions. So if I select one of my connection points here, you can see there's these DOF inputs, or degree of freedom inputs, and these are the boundary condition inputs for the connection point. So the analysis needs boundary conditions to restrain the line. And if it doesn't have boundary conditions, then the line is free to move. And if the line is free to move, then inevitably it's going to run into convergence difficulties for static analysis, because the static analysis assumes no movement. So I can see straight away here that you know these boundary conditions have been left empty, and that's not really appropriate, or it's not physically reasonable. So to overcome that, we should be defining boundary conditions in all translational degrees of freedom, so that's one to three. So they're, they're the, the movements in the various directions. Below that then there's boundary conditions in, in degrees of freedom four to six, and they're rotational boundary conditions. And for most normal lay scenarios where you have the catenary in the vertical XY plane, then you want to restrain it both torsionally and also out of plane rotation. So uh, a torsional restraint would be about degree of freedom five. So that's a rotation about the, the y-axis, the horizontal y-axis. And an out-of-plane rotation degree of freedom would be around the global x-axis, which is degree of freedom four. So these five boundary conditions would represent the kind of recommended boundary conditions for a, a seabed connection point or a connection point on the seabed. If I look again at my other connection point, my line is starting at my vessel connection point VCP1. It's ending at the fixed connection point FCP1. So I've already looked at FCP1. If I look at VCP1, I can see here again that the boundary conditions have been left empty. Now, if my line is attached to a tensioner, then the tensioner itself will provide some boundary conditions. So the tensioner will restrain the pipe from translation of movement. Uh, what it won't restrain it for is rotational movement. So again, the torsional degree of freedom will be free unless I specify a boundary condition in the UF5. And similarly, I, I don't really want any out of plane rotation at my tensioner, so I need to specify a boundary condition in degree of freedom 4.
So the boundary conditions covered. And you know, obviously by addressing that, it will help the model converge. However, I can also see another issue with this particular model, and that relates to what's happening here at the stinger tip. At the stinger tip, I can see there's quite a bend in the pipe. And this is very unreasonable when you consider that the pipe is essentially a rigid arm. So this level of deformation is quite excessive. And the analysis would probably run into conversion difficulties uh, as it introduces nonlinear material properties, because essentially a hinge is going to form at this point. And obviously from an engineer perspective as well, you never want your pipe to uh, display this behavior or encounter this behavior. So what's causing it? Well, it's really quite simple, quite straightforward. The, the length of the line is too long for the distance between the connection points. Pipelay's model component is very versatile. We have control over where we position the points and how long the line length is. Uh, and that's to give or to allow the user to, to build very general scenarios. However, it does mean the users need to keep in mind what's happening when they're defining their lengths and their positions for their connection points. And they need to validate that the departure angle of the pipe is in line with expectations or what could physically happen offshore. And in this case, it's not physically reasonable. So how do we overcome that? Well, there's two options. We can either shorten the line in order to get a more gradual uh, slope on the pipe, or, or conversely, we can move the, the connection point further away from the vessel. They're both manual changes, and there might be certain fine tuning required for that. But if we remember my original model, uh, I used an automatic connection point. So I'm going to try and apply that in this instance as well. But with a seabed connection point, this calculate position allows me just to ignore the coordinates and the pipe may calculate them for me. And pipe play, as it's calculated for those positions, will always check to make sure that the angle here at the tip is less than the, 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 the angle of the stinger itself. So that means we get a nice smooth transition at the stinger tip. So let, let's put that into, into practice. Again, I need to make sure my boundary conditions are right. So I want to give restraint and degrees of freedom one to five. And now I need to change my end point for my line. So I'm going to move from the fixed connection point, which has a, a manual set of coordinates, to a seabed connection point, whose coordinates will be calculated by the pipe laser interface. There we go. We can see now that the line profile is, removed, is improved dramatically. We're no longer getting our excessive deformation on the tip. We're getting a nice smooth transition from overbent to segment. If I run this in my analysis now, you can see now the analysis has successfully converged and has actually ran to completion. Those two changes, the application of boundary conditions and also the more appropriate positioning of my seabed end has uh, improved the model and improved the robustness of the model. So just to go back to um, my connection points, you can see here that originally the line was connected to my VCP, my vessel connection point. So this is a manual point. And that is fine. There's no reason why we can't use a manual point. But for ease of setup, I would always try to use my tensioner connection point. Uh, and again, and the simple reason for that is that the, the coordinates are calculated for me. So I don't have to manually define each of these coordinates. The user interface will calculate them based on the position of the tensioner. So it's just for ease of use. I would recommend that you always try to use automatic connection points, whether it be at a tensioner, whether it be at the seabed, or whether it be at some support. Those other automatic connection points will, first of all, make it quicker to set up the model, but secondly, they will also give you generally a better position than you'll ever achieve manually. 
So try use them as, in, a, in as much as possible. And just be sure to check for the boundary conditions. So when we have a, a connection point at a tensioner, we need to remember to restrain 4 and 5. And when we have a boundary condition at a, a seabed connection point, we we'll need to restrain 1 to 5. So we need to restrain all of the degrees of freedom. And when we do that, um, and we make sure that the line profile looks reasonable uh, with no severe bending of the pipe, or in, in or indeed stretching of the pipe, then uh, we should get a converged solution. Just one, a couple other points to make you aware of um, in terms of model of best practice. And these are more for an efficiency point of view, for, for the analysis efficiency. You know, we should always try to achieve an optimum line length or an optimum number of elements. So if we have too many elements in, in the solution, the solution is going to take that bit longer to complete, particularly for dynamic analysis. So we should always try to keep uh, the line length short enough to give us a reasonable runtime, but also we want to make sure it's long enough to, that it f physically represents you know, the, the actual pipe criteria in reality. So if I look at this uh, model here, I can see there's quite a stretch of line on the seabed. And while that's fine from a convergence point of view, it, it will make our runtime a bit slower. So in this particular case, I think it's warranted to reduce the length of the line and possibly looking at the, the ruler bar here, possibly by a couple of hundred meters. So if, if I go back to my line component, I can quickly adjust this, or refactor this to take off, let's say 300 meters of pipe. Going back to the model then, I can see now that the my seabed connection point has been recalculated, it's been repositioned. I still have a smooth profile but the amount of excess line on the seabed has been reduced. So that's a real benefit for the runtime. And again, it highlights the, the, the advantage of using a seabed connection point, an automatic connection point. If, if I was using a fixed connection point, I'd have to move the point myself after adjusting the line length. But because I'm using the automatic seabed connection point, pipe play is moving it for me. So, I suppose you're probably asking, well, what's what's a, a guideline length for a given water depth? And it actually does vary depending on the water depth and depending on, on whether you're dealing with S lay or J lay. But let's, if we focus on S lay, kind of guideline values for, for line length or recommended line lengths. So for shallow water like this, you will be talking about anywhere between 15 and 35 times the water depth. So you take your water depth and you scale it by anywhere between 15 and 35. And that will give you an approximate uh, length for your line. Um, obviously, the shallower it is, the, the larger the scale factor. For deeper water, though, uh, the scale factor reduces. And if we go to a deep water scenario, so we're talking about water depths in excess of a couple hundred meters, then the, the, the scale factor uh, reduces dramatically. So you could be going to just 1.5 times the water depth or 3.5 times the water depth for your line length. So it's worth keeping those kind of uh, scale factors uh, or ratios in mind when you're, when you're defining your lines um, in pipeline. Um, that being said, more than likely in a future version, the software itself will calculate the line length uh, based on the water depth. So I think that's pretty much it for, for the model components. There is more advice uh, provided in the best practice technical note, which you can get in the, in the pipeline documentation set. And uh, that's a good document, not just for the model components, but also for all components of pipeline. So I would recommend referring to that. Um, even if you're an existing user, there will be useful points in it and more detailed points than I would have provided here. So um, that's it for me. Uh, I hope you've found this um, a useful tutorial. Obviously, if you have further queries, you can feel free to contact us at uh, software.support at mcskenny.com. Thank you for your time today.